Namaste, uh, Jorgen. Namaste. Welcome to Ahimsa Conversations. And thank you so much for making time. Um, I was hoping we could start with, uh, if you could share, what is your earliest recollection of the concept of nonviolence or the experience of it? Uh, you know, maybe from childhood. Uh, I remember I started looking for alternatives to the military in when I was 14 year old. That was one of my earliest declaration. And I could, I could find very little, but I found a small book by Gandhi in the library. And uh, since then he has been following me through my life. It was a small collection of quotes called For Pacifists. Ah, okay. Published okay. by Nova Yivan Publishing House. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And from there to becoming a full-fledged peace activist, is there any aspect of the journey you would like to share before we get into the main issues? Well, when I was 18, the government invited me to a course in conflict handling, conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. It was called military service. They want me to, to be trained to kill people. And I said, no, thank you. No, I don't like that style of handling conflicts. So I was condemned to 16 months in prison for refusing for the service. I see. And inside that prison, I was together with people who has been committing murder. And I was there because I refused to kill. So it made me to think and reflect quite a lot. Uh, and I learned a lot about power, political power, because I was up against NATO, the big NATO army with nuclear weapons and so on, and they wanted to make me a soldier. Mm. But I realized that that couldn't happen without me cooperating with them. Mm. When I refused to cooperate, they didn't manage to make a soldier out of me. They had the power to punish me, but not to make a soldier out of me. And the feeling of being stronger than NATO when you are 18, 20, that's a very good feeling. Yes, very good. Yes. Many people have spoken about that. Indeed, indeed. Uh, was Johan Galtung an influence at this stage of your life or was that much later? later? A little later, a little later. We, we become very good friends and been working together quite a lot of, over the years. Right. He's been inspiring me a lot. Because one of your books is a tribute to uh, Galtung's work. You edited a volume uh, on his yeah. 80th birthday. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yet, I think you have some strong views on the limitations of peace studies. Maybe if you could describe, mm -hmm. uh, I, it, it seems to me there is some tension between the world of peace studies and nonviolence. Uh, and nonviolent resistant. Could you explain that? What is the nature of this tension? Yeah, I was invited to different uh, universities and peace studies departments. And I went to look on what they've been publishing. It was almost only on wars. There were experts on studying and doing research on the effects of war, the cost of war and so on. And I was asking, where is the peace in this? Why do you call it peace studies? It should more, more accurately be called war studies. But they decided to, to call it peace studies, but peace just as absence of war. And not even that sometimes, only studies of war. And it's called peace studies for some strange reasons. I guess it's a little more sexy and a little, little more easy to get money for, but <laughs> I was very, very disappointed. Mm -hmm. so all these huge books and studies, costly research, that very seldom focused on nonviolence. Mm -hmm. So I opposed to that and I've been, been quarreling with many of my colleagues in the field over the years. Why don't we have a university studies mainly on nonviolence? And that's very, very seldom. Mm -hmm. You don't Is find that... it in Europe. Sorry, go ahead. I'm so sorry. Please go ahead. You don't find it in Europe or the US, there are a couple of places in India, but uh, very little of it is really focusing on nonviolence around the world. It's a growing field still, but not, not on the right focus. Is that because in Western Europe and, in, and perhaps in the Americas also, uh, nonviolence is still not taken very seriously? Is it still seen as a fringe phenomenon in the human 
social political process? Is that what is happening? Yeah, it's partly that, but it's also too few who really take it seriously among the academics and so on. Mm. Uh, I, I was in this movement of those that used military service. Mm. And every country we have military obligatory service, people who refuse want to do some training in nonviolent techniques, nonviolent strategies, but they never got that. Not a single state in the world have trained their own population to nonviolent resistance. I mean, I was, was wondering why could that be? It must be better that they could act in some ways, even if the state believed in the gun. And there are so many young boys who wanted to defend the country and their values, but not with the use of guns. But can't they be trained in, in nonviolence and nonviolent techniques? Yeah. And the only answer I get is that states are afraid of training their own population in nonviolent techniques because it could be used against them, against their own state. So I think they realize the power of it, yes. but they're afraid of, let's say, the present climate movement or the present peace movement. If they were really trained and skilled in nonviolent strategies, mm. it would be very, very powerful, also against yeah. their own state. Yes, but I, we've, the Americans are paying a heavy troll, aren't they, for people who train in weapons and, and wreak havoc in random mm. acts of violence. So training people to kill is equally dangerous, actually. But it seems like the states are less afraid of that. I of think that. they are better equipped to handle the violent uprisings than the non-violent ones. Yeah. And as you probably know, the, the recent studies on, on the revolutions tells yeah. us that the unarmed revolutions are more successful than the armed ones. That's a very clear tendency since the early 1980s and That's up right. to today. That's it's right. not it's not the revolution that creates a perfect society, but yeah. to remove an old authoritarian regime, the unarmed strategies have been quite effective in the last 40 years. Um, you are the deputy editor of a journal called Resistance Studies magazine. It's a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, can called, you... It is called the, the Journal of, of Resistance Studies. Okay. Uh, could you say a bit more about that? What is the nature of this journal? What is some of the ground that it covers? We are a handful of friends and colleagues going along back who, in the same way as I protested and, and reacted to the so-called peace studies, we wanted to have a new branch on that a tree, a new field of, of studies. Mm -hmm. We wanted to do research and publish articles on Nonviolent resistance, uh, not only on uh, the revolutionary resistance, but to everyday resistance. What people do in their homes, in their in their in workplaces, in schools, at universities, everywhere. So we have started this this journal. We are into the eighth year now, and we have a lot of articles per every issue, and it's quite well recognized. That is. Uh, let's call it an experiment to see if we could build something more interesting within the academic field. And we are really encouraging activists to contribute as well, even if we have quite high academic standards. We also invite people with, with less formal education and more practical skills into our journal. Mm. You're also the coordinator of the Nordic Nonviolence Study Group. Mm. Uh, and uh, maybe this is a good place for you to share something with our uh, audience on uh, the kind of very uh, long standing links between the Gandhian tradition and, and nonviolence, not only in the field of resistance, but also in the field of ecology. Uh, mm. uh, so, could you say a bit more about this nonviolence study group in the Nordic countries? Yeah, um, one of my big inspirations when I was young was Arne Ness. Arne Ness was a philosopher from Norway who was yes. into eco-philosophy and environmental actions, but also very skilled in Gandhian studies. He has written some of the best books on Gandhian philosophy ever written. Yeah. It's only in Norwegian, but uh, it's a, 
very excellent book. Uh, and Arne was become a very good friend. And he has inspired me to think, not only is it a big problem with wars, but the society as such is harmful. You know, divorce is what the peace study people call the direct violence, the kill with intention. And there are around three, four hundred people killed every day for the moment of direct violence in war zones. Maybe four, five hundred today with Ukraine. But the structural violence, the unjust structures that people can't survive because they don't have access to basic needs like food, clean water, medicine and so on, kills as many every day as the war kills every year. It's a much more serious problem for humanity, the structural violence. And we're trying to see what could you do about that? We need some sort of a new peace movement focusing on poverty, injustices, and uh, lack of, of equal distribution of water. I mean, most people dying early every day, but dying before the, the die out of age, is dying because they don't have access to drinking water. So the mothers has to mix the milk powder with dirty water. The kids are drying out before they get five years old. That is a serious, serious problem for all over the world. And very few people want to talk about it. It's much more spectacular to focus on the war in Ukraine or in Syria or in Libya and so on. And of course, these wars are horrible. But if you want to focus on where you could save most lives, get people access to drinking water. When people buy a small plastic bottle of water on the petrol station in Europe today, they pay more for the water than they pay for the petrol because it is the market who decides the price of the water. And the privatization of, of water supplies all over the world is the most dangerous system we've ever invented. And you let the market forces decide who should afford to buy water, food, medicine, people are dying in huge numbers, yeah. huge numbers. Yeah. Uh, and that uh, is, that is a kind of violence that I think Gandhi was partly looking into with his constructive program. It wasn't very successful after, after 48. Some experiments, the ashrams and the village communities. But we need something similar to that in, in the present situation all over the world. We need to have constructive resistance to construct alternatives here and now. And that's partly what we do in this Nordic Nonviolent Study Group. We are trying to come up with research and we write books and so on on how to start building the new society here and now. That is not to say stop to protest against the bad things in the world, but in addition to protesting and fighting against the injustices, you need to start building the society you would like to see in the future. Yeah. Start here and now. So in this small the Nordic Nonviolence Study Group, we have a small community, maybe 10 people who are coming together. We are producing a lot of our own food. We have study circles, we do research. We have a huge library here with 50,000 volumes. Uh -huh. We are trying to encourage people to come here and learn how to produce food, how to produce your own houses yeah. and uh, construct the new world. Yeah. Part of the problem I see is that too many of people around the world are focusing on the state level. They believe the states should solve the problems. And, the, and states are very problematic from a nonviolent perspective. States comes with nationalism. It comes with them and us. You see it in the sports, so you see it in the, in the culture. And I think we need to go around that, that division that some belongs to one state, some belongs to another state, and see what can we do across these division lines. Yeah. I'm, not very, I'm not very happy to, to use the nationalistic flags. I don't like to see 
even in India, in mean, all these flags all around are very proud on the National Liberation Day and so on. I don't get good feelings coming out yeah. of that. Yeah. It is them and us. We need to work together. And states as a system were created in 1648 after the so-called Peace Treaty of, 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 of Westphalia. Yeah. And they haven't been very successful in, in creating good societies. Yeah. Yeah. They're too big, yeah. some of them. You've been very involved with the War Resisters International. And I've always felt that the very concept of uh, War Resisters International is in some ways uh, transcends the idea of the nation state and, and therefore a mobilization against war of all kinds by all uh, people and in and and you know in all situations uh, could you say a bit here about uh, could you explain what has been the journey of war resistors international and and you served as uh, chairman uh, mm -hmm. in the 90s uh, so what has been the journey and what does it look like now because i get the feeling that maybe that work is at slightly at a low ebb just now or am i wrong i think you're right the, the first thing to reflect on is that World Citizen International have national sections. They have a Norwegian section, a German section, an Indian section, and so on. So we are still based on the nation, to the nation state. I don't like that, but that's how it is, and it has always yeah. been. And then the the base for the activities has been around military service. They've been support of those who refuse military service. So. They have the peaks when there are wars going on and people are called up for service. <laughs> and they have been struggling to survive when there is less wars going on. <laughs> and that's very sad to see, of course. I would like them to focus more on the on the other forms of violence than just killing from the battlefield. And there are some experiments going on for the moment, but in War System International to focus more on other kinds of violence. I think they have a very good purpose and they've done a, they've done a lot of good work, but uh, it's not enough, obviously not enough. And they are weak, they have very few resources. And uh, I haven't been involved on the, on the global level since I left as a chairperson. I've just been from the sideline watching what's going on. But I see they have been expanding in South America, that's very good. Yeah. They are expanding into Eastern Europe. That's relatively new. That didn't happen when I was the chairperson. So there are some expansion. And today, in the last weeks, they have been helping those that refuse military service in Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. And that's, of course, not very popular in, in Ukraine to, to refuse to fight today when everyone is asked to join and kick out the Russians. But so they are weak and they've always been on, on the fringe, all these, all these resistors. But there have been some remarkable, so moving to Ukraine, um, what do you make of the remarkable uh, uh, stories that we are getting from uh, with pictures of people kneeling before tanks and, mm -hmm. and you know, standing bravely in the path of tanks, of talking soldiers out mm -hmm. of uh, uh, the combatant, role uh yeah. what is your view i mean you, uh, you must be following it much more closely than me yeah it's difficult to get good access to information but i i get uh, i get some of it and it's very impressive of course these are small minorities among those who want to take up guns and fighting with the kalashnikovs they are in the majority but i'm very impressed by those brave people who really stand up and use nonviolent strategies. And the international community has reacted with sanctions. And that is a very difficult tool to use. You know from history that sanctions mainly hit the poorest ones in our societies, those with less resources. You remember when the, when the international community had sanctions against Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And those sanctions killed more than a million people because people didn't get access to medicine, water and food yeah. and so on. Yeah. And that is 
more people dying of the sanctions than from the war itself. It's many more killed by those sanctions in Iraq than those killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So it's a very, very difficult tool to use, and it very seldom hits those on the top. I don't think Saddam Hussein went to bed hungry and without medicine and without his cognac in the evening. I think he could survive easily with sanctions. And the same with North Korea. Kim Jong is not really suffering personally, but millions are starving in North Korea due to sanctions. So I'm very critical to some sanctions, unless they can be very specifically targeted against the oligarchs and Putin himself, or the top leadership in the military army. But most sanctions are counterproductive. The other thing about the war in Ukraine is that it's been very popular in Western Europe to have boycotts of Russians, sport people, chess players, artists, in the theater field, everywhere people want to boycott everything that is, that is different Russia. And in my view, that is extremely stupid. What we need to do now is the opposite of boycott. And I, I have come up with a new term. I want to call it girl cot. The opposite of boy is girl, it's a girl cot. And that is to cooperate more strongly and eagerly than ever with the best voices inside the Russian society. Those who dare stand up against Putin and are sent to prison because they are criticizing the war. Yeah. So I want massive girl cots all around Europe. I have an article coming out in the Swedish newspaper tomorrow about that, to introduce the concept of girl cot. Because we need to think ahead. We need to think into the future. When the war ends, all wars will come to an end in the end. And what sort of relations do we want to have with Russia after that? If we boycott all the smartest and best people in Russia today, we are in fact planning for the Cold War 2.0. We are yeah. creating a horrible situation for our kids and grandchildren to take over. If we can't be very friendly with the best of the Russian people. And that doesn't happen. I see so many, including churches, who refuse to have contact with the, with the Russian church. We need to have more extensive, more deeply and more developed cooperation with those voices in Russia who are critical to the war and to Putin. Yeah. That's right. I was happy to see that the World War Resisters International has issued a statement uh, in support of the Russian uh, activist, uh, Ruslan, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who has been, I think, uh, uh, beaten uh, because mm -hmm. he's opposing the war. There is a lot of torture going on, of course. The police are brutal in every country. We know that. If you if you're into prison, you know they're beating you. <laughs> That's how it is. Yeah. And yeah. it's it's it, it takes some courage to oppose Putin today. Yes, it, indeed. I saw the late uh, uh, I saw the latest legislation. If you are and call what's going on in Ukraine for a war, you are sent to prison for fifteen years. You're not allowed to call it a war. It should be called a peace operation. Otherwise, you get 15 years in prison. So yeah. Yeah. horrible legislation. But yeah. some people really dare to speak up against him. And they need our support. We need to cooperate with them, inviting them here, or visiting them in Russia. Yeah. That's what I would like to see instead of boycotts. Boycotts is a very easy way not to do anything. I mean, yeah. that is the concept of boycott, not to act. And I want people to be engaged and help those who really need support yeah. and do good work. Which would then be a form of constructive action. Yeah, I just used the concept yeah. Yeah. for girl cop because I think so, that's a really yeah. nice. You know, ever since the fall of the wall of Berlin, so mm. uh, which is now uh, more than uh, 30 years, there have been very concerted efforts by many kinds of European activists for uh, dismantling NATO, hmm. right? Why did, why did these struggles meet with so little success? Is it, uh, is it just the power play? You see, 
uh, NATO was struggling to justify their own existence when the Warsaw Pact fall apart. And they were looking around who could be the next enemy. They wanted, they needed, they needed a strong enemy to justify the budget. So they were looking into Muslims, that was popular for some time, and it was terrorists. And they were looking around and all this, they were so happy to get Russia back again. Nordel is going up in the budget. In Sweden has promised to send more uh, uh, to spend more money on the military. Finland maybe want to join NATO. But NATO, I mean, it's a war organization with extremely powerful friends. All these member states have strong lobbies. The military industrial media complex is supporting them. And the peace voices outside is not strong enough or many enough to stand up against that strong political force to support NATO. Another, I mean, every new NATO member will expand the countries with nuclear weapons. You know, I talked about non-proliferation non earlier, but to expand more NATO members as we have done since 89 is to expand the territory where nuclear weapons are stationed and placed and used. So it's a horrible development. And that points back to a very basic question. What is it we want to defend? Is it the territory on the map? Is it the number of square kilometers? Or is it the people living there? Or is it the buildings? Or is it the social movements in, inside that territory? And the military means can only defend territory. They can't defend democracy. They can't defend I mean, human rights. We have seen them trying so many times in the last decades in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Somalia, in Libya, in Syria, all over the place. And military means are not able to create a good society. Some years ago, I was invited to the War Academy in London. Mm. And that was very interesting. These people are clever and they had a lot of experiences. Some of them have been in the army since the Falkland Wars. They've been to Afghanistan, they've been to Iraq and they've been to all over the place there are wars going on in the, in the British Empire. And they were quite shy in the, in the lecture hall but in the bar in the evening, <laughs> these high rank officers opened up a little more of the couple of whiskeys. And they said, you see, Jürgen, our politicians are ordering us to go abroad and fix problems for them. And they say they want us to create democracy. They want us to create respect for human rights, to help the women in Afghanistan and so on. But we are equipped and trained to kill people. <laughs> And that's what we do, and we do it pretty well. We don't have the skills to create democracy or respect for human rights. You can't use the bomb for very many other things than killing people or destroying buildings. That's the purpose of it. That's how it is constructed. And that's how we are trained. So when politicians have a, a, a universal idea about sending the Marines and you could fix the problem, they are wrong. But these officers doesn't dare to talk until after they've been retiring. But are... I find it fascinating that the academy invited you. Yeah, it, it was a former student of mine from the, from the university in, in Switzerland who invited me to come to speak to his officers. I've been to quite a lot of, of war academies in Indonesia, in Turkey, and so on. Yeah. And I find very often we have more interesting discussions because. You see, when I talk to peace activists, they don't know very much of their own history. They're very bad in their own movement's history. But the militaries, they know the battlefields from Napoleon up to today. Yeah, that's part of the curriculum. But if I ask students in Sweden, if they know how the Swedish plans for a nuclear bomb was stopped and abolished, they don't know. It's not documented. Peace movements are extremely bad on documenting their own history. Yeah. Evaluating what they did. 
the same yeah. with the women's movement. The women's movement doesn't remember or know the strategies used to to get the voting rights for women. Yeah. It's just vaguely mentioned in some history books. But the militaries are very, very good. They know the history. I, I wonder if one reason for this could be that institutionalized structures uh, are always um, more likely to cohere over a very extended period of time. And therefore, they maintain very deliberately that organizational memory. Whereas the very nature of social movements, and it, to some to a large extent, that is their uh, gift also, is that they are dispersed, they are decentralized, uh, you know, they are spontaneous, and uh, and so a great deal, as you say, of knowledge and wisdom, is kind of not lost, but it is obscured. Between the I, think you, I think you describe the problem well, but I don't agree that it is how it should be. No, of course not. But I I'm just trying to understand generation. how it works. Yeah, I see every new generation starting from square one, learning how to act. If, if the militaries did that, they couldn't go on fighting new wars. Or farmers, they've been learning for thousands of generations how to cultivate the fields. Or the builders building houses. They learn from their past history and it's documented mistakes and success stories. And they learn that in the schools and in the universities and in the training camps and so on. But women's movement, peace movement, environmental movement, very, very little. I see my own son repeating the mistakes I did when I was 14 today, when he is engaged, because he doesn't know the history. <laughs> I've been myself too bad on documenting what I've done. I've been, I've been trying to improve in the last years. I've been writing more books about their own history. But we need to do the same as the militaries, document and evaluating. And not only success stories, not only what we could brag about. Yeah. We could learn just as much about our mistakes or the stupid things they've done in the peace movement's history, or the, in the Gandhi movement's history. Yeah, yeah. John, there's a very basic question that many people uh, raise uh, when, when I talk to them about nonviolence. They ask if, after all, isn't violence more natural to human beings? Mm. Because something in the whole socialization process uh, or maybe the educational, the formal educational process leads people to believe that violence is a natural impulse and mm -hmm. nonviolence is something that is a moral phenomenon. It has to be learned, it has to be acquired, etc. And that is why no matter how long the period of peace is, or at least of non-combat, non uh, one war uh, is enough for uh, a lot of people to believe that, ah, see, war is inevitable. Mm. So both these phenomena, how do you respond to this? It's a very complex issue, but a very important one. I would say that if it was a natural behavior of homo sapiens to kill each other, it wouldn't survive as a species. We have been better on cooperating and helping each other to survive and develop. But when you are on the, on the individual level attacked, most people will, will react with whatever violence means they have. But, but on the group level as a society, we've been much more uh, cooperating and, and helping each other in order to develop. I mean, the anarchist Kropotkin in his book, Mutual Aid, described that very well. In order to survive in the long run and to, and to improve, you need to help. And that is the natural thing. And it was realized by the American militaries after the war in Vietnam, uh, after the First and Second World War, because they understood that most soldiers were given a gun they didn't want to kill. So they missed. Most of the bullets never hit another body. So they retrained the soldiers to kill without reflecting on what they were doing. 
That's part of the modern military training, not thinking, not reflecting, just act immediately, shoot on whatever you see. If you're going to a war zone, you see all these bullet holes in the buildings, that's because people are just trained to shoot as much as possible, not targeting and aiming and see other human beings, because then most people will refuse to kill. That's part of our nature. It's very difficult to get a person to kill another one if you don't have any, any mental problems. Most normal people doesn't kill each other. But this also reminds me, to back to your questions earlier about the peace studies. You see, most of the studies on conflicts are focusing on the most violent conflicts. That goes for the huge ones in our world, the, the wars, but also on the more local level. There is a lot of studies on, on domestic violence. When the male partner beat the female partner, but they only count those cases where they're using knives, guns, or fists, and there is serious wounds sending to hospital. That, that is a studied in the big databases and other and, and then the third program so on. All those cases where the man and the woman could solve the problems nicely, hugging each other, talking, asking the neighbor to mediate, making love together, they're never recorded. They're never studied. So the best examples of nice conflict management is never studied. It's not part of the university studies. Only when people are killed or seriously harmed, it's counted as, an, a, as a conflict. And the same between states. There were lots of statistics on wars, but not on all those to become a war. When people could solve the disagreements without killing each other. They are not studied. And I can't understand why. If you want to learn how to do it in the future, look into the best examples, not the most horrible ones. That goes on all levels, individual, group, state, global level. We should be much more eager to study the best examples we have. But you know, the media is focusing on the most horrible violence, most history books. If you go to the library in your city, ask for the history books for the peace, you, you won't find it. We have hundreds of volumes on the history of wars in India. Yeah, yeah. But they don't have the history of peace in India or in US or in Norway or in Cameroon or in, in, or in Brazil. Yeah, yeah. Because I, peace is not an issue for most academics. There is also a, perhaps an element of uh, how this, this trend has maybe been solidified by the modern mass media because there is an underlying uh, quite explicit uh, assumption that peace is not entertaining mm -hmm. and violence is. Most journalists are trained when they are going to universities and schools to cover spectacular actions. That's right. That's easy. That's that easy. is what constitutes a story. Yeah, but I'm absolutely convinced that it's possible to write exciting, and very good stories about peace issues as well. Yeah. But it's not part of the curriculum for journalists or editors or anything like that. There are some few exceptions, but not very many. Yeah. I, I've been working a little on what they call the peace journalism, where we're trying to present alternatives rather than just describing the horrible consequences of war, looking into the victim situation and so on. But it's not easy. It takes time. But yeah. when yeah. I meet the group of people and can talk about my experiences from war zones and having good examples, they're very, very interested in it. Absolutely very interested. Spectacular. Absolutely. Around the, about what was called the Arab Spring. Yeah, yeah. That was big, big events, very yeah. little violence. Yeah. It didn't turn out very well in every case, but it was a fascinating story that all the mainstream media covered. Which that did. they did they did even yeah. the even the uprising in uh, in ukraine back in uh, uh, when 2004, was it? 2014 that's right that's right yep. so jorgen in closing 
could you share your overall uh, sense of uh, confidence about the future do you see the whole uh, striving for nonviolence in its multiple forms and mm. multiple levels do you mm. see it growing and uh, having a greater impact or um, are you despairing because as some you know so many people have said at the moment uh, uh, that many people across the world i think the vast majority of people are not aware how much closer to the nuclear brink we are at the moment mm -hmm. than we have been maybe since maybe the cuban missile crisis yeah. uh, and and that how little we are agitated about it and you know how little resistance there is to this apocalyptic threat mm. so what is your overall uh, i'm not asking for a prediction but mm -hmm. i mean in what ways do you put your faith into the future uh, before i answer let me have a short comment on the on the cuba crisis in 1962 mm. that is very, that is very relevant that was a few missiles placed on the independent state of Cuba outside the coast of USA. And US reacted extremely strongly, threatening with a nuclear war, as you said. Imagine the same thing today if China had nuclear weapons in Mexico and Canada. What would you what would US do then? Horrible uh, reactions. But from the point of view of Moscow, they have American nuclear weapons coming closer and closer and closer to the Russian border. That is not to defend what Putin is doing, but it is to explain why it happens. He is seriously afraid of having so many American nuclear weapons in the NATO countries so close to his border. So we should reflect on that situation from 62 when we look on the situation today. Absolutely no, no defense for Putin, but to explain why he react. I think it's extremely stupid to expand NATO eastwards. That will end up with the reaction from the people in Moscow, whoever they are. But back to your other overall question about the future and my prospect for what's going on. I will call, then I will connect back to Arne Ness, my professor in philosophy. We were quite depressed. This was back in the 70s and 80s, the Cold War, the silent spring and the environmental problems popping up and acid rain and fishes dying and so on. And when we came and complained to Arne, he said, I don't care if you're optimist or pessimist, but it is your damn duty to act as if you were an optimist. <laughs> that is the only decent thing for humans to do. Act as if you were an optimist. I don't care what to think in, in your heart or in your brain, but your duty is to act now and invite more people to act as if you were an optimist. Do the best you can. There you are placed in the society or in, in your country or in your family or in the country. True. Act so true. And, and work hard. Yeah. Even if you have bad thoughts and it looks very dark and gloomy in the, in the horizon. Things are going up and down. And we don't have very much of a choice. You yeah. could commit suicide, or you have to continue act as if, as if you were an optimist. From your rich life, what advice would you share with young people who do want to do this, and you know who are in many ways uh, doing precisely this, uh, and and I think they are doing it in so many different dimensions. So, what would you share with them in terms of how to keep up your inner strength? Because I think that's the decisive factor. Mm. Don't isolate yourself. Mm. Create networks of good friends thinking in the same manner. And today you can do that globally on the net and so on. Find friends all around the world who think like you do and work together. There is no other way to create a better world. I was born into a society in the 50s that was in much worse shape. Now, in much better shape than what I'm leaving quite soon. So my generation has failed completely. But I have trust in the young people. 
they could do it better than we did. They could create a more peaceful and less polluted world than we, had, we have been doing in my generation. And if they, if they work together, they could absolutely be very, very strong and change the situation for the people to come after us. Thank you so much. Thank you for making the time and thank you for what you do. My pleasure. Bye bye. Bye then. Thank you. And thanks to Swati also for bringing us together. I'll send you the draft of the bio just now in about five minutes. Okay. Yep. That's okay. fine. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.